I'm Dr. Todd Lizon from Lifestyle Integration and NIR Saunas. I subscribe to Google Alerts on a regular basis for a number of topics, but usually, if I'm perfectly honest, I never even read them. But yesterday was totally different. I came across a study yesterday that caught my attention so much so that I dropped absolutely everything else that I was doing, started researching, looking at even more papers on the topic, and absolutely had to shoot this video for you today. The name of the study, and I want to make sure that I get it right so that you can look it up for yourself if you're interested, is Dynamical Features in Fetal and Postnatal Zinc Copper Metabolic Cycles Predict the Emergence of Autism Spectrum Disorder. That's a long and complicated name, but what it's essentially saying is that they now can predict who will develop autism spectrum disorders. Here's what they did so you can understand it. They looked at baby teeth. And we all know baby teeth, they're going to be present from about the second trimester of pregnancy up to about one year of age, and then those teeth will fall out. And they took those teeth and they assessed them with the spectroscopy tool, and they looked for things, well they didn't look for things like, they looked for zinc and copper. And a lot of people involved in the autism world know that there's issues with zinc and copper, but they can't quite figure out exactly what it is. So this is what they were measuring, is zinc and copper. And teeth are like trees in the sense that they have these, uh, with a tree, you've got these rings of growth that tell you when there was a drought in 1971, there was a fire in 1975. Teeth give you similar information. And what they looked for was the cycles, their circadian rhythms. Rhythms is the word that they're looking for. And zinc and copper have rhythms just like a lot of systems in our body. So people are familiar with a menstrual cycle over 28 days, with a sleep cycle over 24 hours. Um, we're familiar with cortisol cycles. Well, zinc and copper have cycles as well, and they measured these. And what they found is that when they measured these cycles, they looked for different variables in, in these rhythms, and they found that they were able to see dysfunction in those rhythms that was able to then be able to be used to predict autism. And I'll read you exactly what they found. What they found is that their model was 90% accurate in predicting autism cases with 100% sensitivity for autism spectrum disorder diagnoses and 85% specificity to controls. Predicting it to 90% or even more based on zinc and copper rhythms. This is phenomenal information to have because what it means is that we now know that autism is either, well, is basically from when you're pregnant to the very first couple of months, it's already there and then something has to necessarily trigger it or bring it on later in life. But we know that zinc and copper imbalance is involved. Is it the cause? This is the big question now that we're going to get and I think people will be interested in. Is Can we say that this zinc copper rhythm problem is the cause of autism? No. This is where we can run into all kinds of problems. All they're saying is they can predict it and they know that this rhythm problem is part of it. What we need to do is ask the question, why? Why are these rhythm issues present? What's causing these rhythm issues that in turn is laying the stage for autism? So what might cause some of these zinc copper issues that are causing autism? I've compiled a very generalized list of potential issues that we need to be looking into that might explain why we're seeing these issues with zinc and copper. The first reason comes down to genes. If we look at the things like MTHFR defects, which a lot of people are familiar with, we know that we've got genes for certain predispositions, and if you are homozygous, you have more problems than if you're heterozygous, meaning if you have two copies that are affected versus only one copy of a gene that are affected. With zinc metabolism, these similar things are happening. And I came across another paper that, it can't be a coincidence, was dated from May 23rd, 2018. 
and it's called, called Prospects of Zinc Supplementation in Autism Spectrum Disorders and Shankopathies Such as Phelan McDermott Syndrome. A lot of fancy language, it's a very complicated paper, but what they're looking at is the genes, and I should probably read that here, the protein encoded by the Shank 3 gene is regulated by zinc. Zinc regulates the gene, and the gene expression is what we're concerned with. So while zinc deficiency depletes synaptic, synaptic pools of Shank 3, increased zinc levels were shown to promote synaptic scaffold formation. Therefore, the hypothesis arises that patients with PMDS and autism caused by Shankopathies having one intact of Shank 3 left may benefit from zinc. And this paper goes on to look at it, and they go on into some great detail about what's happening, where zinc will help some people, but there's other issues to take into account, like absorption through the stomach. That needs to occur. They also talk about um, passing the blood-brain barrier. So it's not necessarily just about giving zinc, but if we can look at the genes and figure this stuff out, we may be able to then better help get the supplements to a person. So there's assisted delivery methods that they're looking at. So genes is definitely one factor that could be contributing to why we're seeing this zinc and copper problem. The second is copper overload. Now I do a lot of hair tissue mineral analysis tests with people over the years and one of the problems that are becoming very significant for a very large number of people is copper overload. Too much copper in the body dominates and ends up creating issues with zinc. Zinc and copper need to be in a proper balance. Now, we're asking the why questions. Why is this occurring? Are we just exposed to more copper? Not really. It's more of a retention issue. And the issue at hand is typically what's called xenoestrogens or estrogen mimickers. And a lot of people are familiar with these. They're sometimes called gender bender chemicals. Things like um, plastics, things like pesticides, petroleum products, um, arsenic, soy. There's a lot of things that mimic estrogen. And when you do that, you retain copper at a higher rate. And then copper plays havoc with the internal mechanisms and delivery of things like zinc and, and, and copper, basically. So copper overload is a big, big deal, and a hair tissue mineral analysis would be one of the ways to try to assess what's going on with the mineral copper, as well as zinc. So copper overload. A third reason that we might see issues with zinc and copper are mitochondrial problems, mitochondrial respiration, metabolic syndromes. Now, the, 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 the mitochondria, for those of you that don't know, is the energy powerhouse in the cell. It's trying, well, it's, it's creating your ATP, which is your energy. And back to high school biology, that's your um, things like um, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, that sort of thing. And it has to follow a pathway. And that pathway needs nutrients present to be able to move on through that pathway to create ATP. If you run into blockages in that pathway, you run into a lack of ATP or energy. And just imagine a cell in the brain trying to function if it doesn't have enough energy. This is a major, major reason for chronic degenerative diseases in the world today. Everything from things like Alzheimer's to diabetes to you name it. And we do know that a percentage of autism cases are related to mitochondrial dysfunction but it is something that can be looked at. So one of the main things that we found that can influence mitochondrial function is the application of near-infrared light or something called photobiomodulation. When you use this near-infrared and red light and that's absorbed by the cells, it increases ATP function. This is a well-documented scientific process that responds extremely well to the application of this near-infrared light. Another way to try to speed up this mitochondrial function is sometimes by giving the body the right fuels, which we know for brain health a lot of the time can be coming from fat. Fat, healthy fats, um, basically produce a, a chemical substance called ketones, which is the alternative fuel for the body. What I recommend as an easier diet and just almost as effective is just making sure that the, the kids or the people are not eating sugars. If you just eat real foods, primarily vegetables and proteins and fats, 
that will usually be somewhat adequate to help your body function better. We need to get rid of the, the, the added sugars, we need to get rid of the glutens and eat real food and that can help with mitochondrial function. Another interesting thing with mitochondrial function for those of you that are interested is the last step of energy production. The very last step is where the near infrared light is absorbed and the two last sort of chemical compounds in there are copper containing enzymes. And I'm putting it out there because I don't have the answer and I don't know if this is related or not. I've looked on the research, I've tried to figure it out if it's somewhat related, but to me it's a bit of a coincidence that we're talking about zinc, copper balance and autism and then the last two steps in the production of energy are copper containing enzymes. So I'm continuing to look into what the link might be there and I'm just putting it out there. If anyone knows anything or can help me out with a little bit of that information, I'd love to hear from you. So mitochondrial function. The next one that might create issues with zinc and copper are what's called channelopathies. Channelopathies, I believe, won somebody a Nobel Prize in the early 90s, and yet most people have still never heard of channelopathies. What they are is the blockage of substances to be able to move in or out of a cell. And these channelopathies will obviously then create these rhythmic um, issues that we would see with zinc and copper, these aberrations that are going on. So channelopathies are often called, caused by toxins. And this is where things like mercury might come into play, but equally possible are things like aluminium or cadmium or other substances that block the channels. So channelopathy becomes a major issue when we're looking at these sorts of things because even if you give the zinc or the copper if it's needed, if the channelopathies are blocking it from getting into the cells, the only fix is to get rid of the toxins. And that's why detoxification has to be a part of an overall approach, at least with the level of knowledge that we currently have. And that's where part of our programs involve near-infrared saunas to promote and encourage, number one, relaxation, which allows for detox to occur, but also through sweating. It's well documented in the literature that sweating does remove toxins and various other methods as well from diet and a couple of key supplements to help with detoxification as well. So channelopathies is a big, big deal. And last but not least would be supplementation. Simply put, if, if a nutrient's not there, then the body can't function properly. And we do know that there is a lot of zinc deficiency that's out there, but as I said earlier, we might not know if just giving the nutrient is going to be enough. So what can we conclude? Well, autism spectrum disorder is predictable. That's huge news. It's predictable and it's present from as early as the second trimester in pregnancy. So, what we need to look at is why are we seeing this zinc and copper um, irregularities in the rhythms? What's causing that? And that's where more research needs to be done. So we don't have all the answers yet, but based on current knowledge, it does make sense to deal with the issues that I've just brought up. Genes, copper overload, mitochondrial issues, channelopathies, and supplementation. So the plan of action is variable. I think all of those things are going to come into play. I think ideally we want to make sure that people that are having children are as healthy and as functional as possible. We want to make sure that we deal with this issue as proactively as we can. If we have children that have already developed autism, to my understanding of the issues, these same concepts would come into play. It's just we may have to have different approaches based on ages and see what's sort of suitable for children. But I wanted to bring this study to your attention because to me it was just absolutely staggering that we now have a method that can predict with at least 90% certainty who will develop autism and it's related to zinc and copper which is what nutritional balancing programs have been talking about in part for a very long time. For more on copper, for more on zinc, for more about nutritional balancing Go visit our websites, lifestyleintegration.com.au or nirsauna.com.au or email us for more information. Until next time, keep well.